Hello. Um, my name is Alexander Popov. I'm glad to tell you about exploiting a Linux kernel vulnerability in video for Linux subsystem. I'm a kernel developer since 2013 and security researcher at Positive Technologies. The plan of the talk. First, I will describe uh, the vulnerability. Uh, I will tell about the bugs, the fixes, which I made. And then I will focus on exploitation on x86-64. Uh, first, about hitting the race condition to provoke the memory corruption. Then, about the control flow hijack uh, for video for Linux subsystem. Then, I will describe the method of bypassing uh, supervisor mode execution and access prevention uh, from the uh, kernel threat context restrictions. And finally, I will tell about privilege escalation payload, show the demo uh, on Ubuntu server, and uh, interesting part, I will tell about possible exploit mitigation. Uh, this vulnerability is uh, local privilege escalation in the Linux kernel, uh, the type of the bug is race condition. Uh, everybody may know that race condition is the situation in software when the uh, result of the uh, computation depends on the order of the computations. In, uh, for example, in uh, simultaneous threads. And uh, this uh, vulnerability, CV 2019 refers to th three similar bugs in the Vivid driver of Video for Linux subsystem. And uh, several major distributions uh, ship this driver as a kernel module. For example, Ubuntu, Arch Linux, uh, SUSE, and some others. A um, few words about Video for Linux. It is a collection of drivers and API uh, for uh, video streaming support in the Linux kernel. And the vulnerable driver, the Vivid driver, uh, it is needed for emulating the hardware uh, uh, which is supported by Video for Linux subsystem. And uh, this hardware includes uh, video capture and output and input device, uh, capture and output devices, radio receivers and transmitters, and software defined uh, radios. Uh, this driver, uh, driver is needed for emulating the hardware to test and develop the user space software which interacts with uh, that hardware uh, through Video for Linux subsystem. And uh, this driver brings the attack surface to the system. It turned out that the devices created by the driver is available to normal user, to regular user on uh, Ubuntu. Uh, because Ubuntu applies read-write access list uh, when the uh, user is logged in. Unfortunately, I didn't manage to auto-load the vulnerable module. Uh, that's why I did the full disclosure. Uh, the timeline. Uh, the bugs were introduced in 2014, and uh, around five years later, my syscaller father with custom modifications hit uh, the, uh, the bug and uh, gave me the crash. I started the investigation and a month and a half after that I had a fully working proof of concept exploit and uh, the fixing patch which I sent uh, to a security team of the Linux kernel. I decided I chosen to be a good citizen of free software so I did the responsible disclosure and 15 minutes later uh, Linus Torvalds replied and review started. And the next day I already pre uh, prepared two more versions of the fixing patch. Um, and uh, Linus allowed to do full disclosure because the driver uh, can't be automatically loaded. Uh, November 4, I, uh, November 2, I did the full disclosure, but two days later Linus suddenly realized that uh, we had a mistake in the patch. Uh, Maybe we can keep details for Q&A. But uh, I sent the next version to the public mailing list since the full disclosure was, uh, has already happened. And the uh, CVE was allocated for this issue. November 8, the patch is taken to the 
to, to the tree of uh, video for Linux maintainer and got to the main line. And in the, at the end of November, uh, this patch was uh, applied to stable trees of the Linux kernel. That was the timeline. What was uh, the actual bug, the bugs, uh, which, which I found? I used, as I said, I used syscaller with custom modifications and uh, kernel address sanitizer uh, detected use after free on the linked list manipulations in uh, the vulnerable driver. I started to investigate it and um, the reason of this memory corruption uh, was quite far from uh, the memory corruption itself. It turned out that there is the same incorrect approach to locking in those three functions. It, it is just copied and pasted uh, in, th in three places. And now, uh, let's do that. Uh -huh. uh, and now, uh, the puzzle for clever system software developers. So uh, we have uh, process context where we close the file descriptor. During uh, this operation, the mutex is locked. But on closing the file descriptor, the kernel thread, which is doing streaming, uh, should be stopped as well, but this kernel thread uses this mutex as well. What can we do to avoid deadlock on the streaming stop? And that was the wrong answer of the developer in 2014. So it decided to unlock mutex a little while, just to put the kernel thread away. So just you can see the mutex at the gate and the kernel thread as a sheep, uh, which is going to get out when we open the door for a while. It was expectations, but the reality that there are a lot of uh, reader, th um, reader processes which can, can compete with kernel thread for that mutex and w win the race. So, uh, if, um, so unlocking the mutex during streaming stop uh, on closing the file descriptor is a bad idea. What happens? Another reading um, function can lock the mutex instead of kernel thread and manipulate the queue of the uh, video for Linux buffers. And that is completely not expected by the video for Linux subsystem, that the queue is modified during the streaming stop. Um, so uh, that is the final patch, which allows to avoid such situations. It is a proper fix. It consists of two parts. The first part, I avoid unlocking the mutex on the streaming stop. Just do, do not unload. Uh, uh, do not unlock. Only uh, ask the thread to stop. And the kernel thread, in kernel thread, I use mutex try lock instead of um, mutex lock, which, uh, with, which immediately fails if it can't lock the mutex. If it fails, it uh, uh, goes to sleep for a while and uh, starts uh, uh, the new iteration of the loop. Uh, what happens uh, in case of uh, vulnerability situation? The file descriptor is being closed and the mutex is locked. Suddenly, the kernel thread wakes up, it tries to lock mutex, fails, and goes to sleep. It happens several times, and uh, then, eventually, the, uh, on closing the file descriptor, the kernel thread stop is called. On next, and next time when, uh, when kernel thread is woken up, it uh, checks that kernel thread should stop, understand that yes, yes, it's okay to, uh, now it is a moment to uh, exit, and finishes. So it is kind of lockless way how to stop the kernel thread during the streaming stop uh, when they have, um, um, they need the same resource together. Now let's uh, speak about the exploitation. Uh, first part of the exploitation is uh, winning the race, uh, so hitting the race condition. That code I run in several p threads, uh, which are uh, running simultaneously, and this code hits the race condition. You can see here that okay, uh, that read in one p thread competes with close 
in another p thread. And when reading is winning uh, and locks the mutex, the linked list is manipulated and the memory corruption can happen. Um, when a reader uh, wins the race condition and uh, locks the mutex, it adds another VB2 buffer into the VB2 queue. And uh, after the streaming is fully stopped, Video for Linux subsystem uh, cleans up the resources and frees all the buffers in this queue. Uh, but the driver is not aware that uh, the, the buffer which was uh, just added is already freed and it still has the reference to the freed object. That is use after free, which happens on the next time when streaming is started again. The file descriptor is opened, and we have one uh, read system call for this file descriptor. And um, here you can see uh, at the kernel address sanitizer report that the object, uh, the vulnerable object, is from uh, kmalloc one kilobyte uh, slab cache. Now, exploiting the use after free, of, uh, how to override the object which was freed. Uh, the idea was to use a brilliant approach by Vitaly Nikolenko, uh, by set exciter powered by user fault FD. What is the main idea? Uh, on the first step, video for Linux allocates the buffer. Then, on streaming stop, it freeze the buffer. And after that, we, from the user space, we call set exciter, and uh, kernel allocates uh, the extended attribute in the kernel space. When the size of the uh, extended attribute is the same, is close to uh, VB2 buffer size, allocator uh, gives the same address which was just freed from the similar slab cache. Uh, that's why we can put our payload on the freed object and overwrite it. Um, as I said, uh, set exciter is powered by user fault FD. It is needed to keep the payload in the kernel space. Um, uh, there is a page fault requested at the end of the area which is uh, allocated in the kernel memory. That's why when the data is copied, the page fault is hit and propagated to the user space. But user space, my uh, handler in the user space does nothing uh, to handle this page fault. That's why uh, the set exciter process hangs and keeps the payload in the kernel space forever. Finally, when we have user to free, uh, access the um, si system works with overwritten object uh, with the payload which we put there. And uh, we have the privilege escalation. But it was not so easy to use this approach in my case because it turned out that the uh, vulnerable VB2 buffer is not the last one which was freed. That's why it was some, uh, deeper, somewhere deeper in the free list and uh, calling only, only, only one kmalloc was not enough to get the same address from the allocator. That's why I really needed to spray. But how to spray when your uh, thread is hanging, uh, hangs on the set exciter uh, system call? And I used uh, the brute force solution. I just created a pool of threads, dozens, uh, dozens of them. And each of them calls uh, set exciter, hangs happily. But we have uh, a lot of allocations in various slab caches. Moreover, this approach allows to spread the uh, allocations, uh, distribute them among uh, different CPUs, uh, and have allocations on all slab caches which are per CPU. So after heap spray is uh, successful, VB2 buffer is overwritten by my payload, and I can use it for privilege escalation. Next step, hijack the control flow uh, in video for Linux subsystem. I was learning this, the code of that subsystem for a long time. It was painful. I, I wanted to find some exploit primitive. Uh, my goal was to 
get arbitrary right primitive, but I didn't manage. But finally, I found uh, the very promising function pointer. Here on this diagram, you can see how objects in Video for Linux uh, are connected together. So there is a VB2 uh, vivid buffer and VB2 uh, buffer structure just at the beginning of the structure. And it has the reference to VB2Q structure, which uh, also has the reference to MemOps structure. In that MemOps structure, we have a lot of uh, function pointers, and this excellent vAdder function pointer, which is very convenient for exploitation. Moreover, you can see that um, memprev field is passed to this function pointer when it is called as an argument. So uh, if we overwrite the VB2 buffer, we can control the argument of the function pointer, which will be called. Really nice. Uh, so I started to uh, the experiment uh, with uh, implementing this, uh, this idea. And first, I disabled supervisor mode access and execution prevention, kernel page table uh, isolation, those features which can disturb the uh, red to user attack. Uh, and uh, I pointed, I, I uh, set the pointer to VB2Q to the user space memory, but I got, all the time I, I got uh, this error, unable to handle page fold. Uh, finally, I found out that this pointer is the referenced in the context of kernel thread where user space is not mapped at all. So uh, uh, that brought the trouble for exploitation. I didn't know uh, how to put the payload. Uh, because if the user space is not mapped at all, I should put the payload somewhere in the kernel space and it should be at the location of address with address which I know. Uh, that was a trouble. But I had a clue. Uh, during this experiment, I dropped the kernel changes which I had for deeper fuzzing. And I uh, saw that just before use after free, Video for Linux gives the kernel warning. And this warning contains a lot of interesting information. And moreover, the kernel log where this warning uh, is printed is available to regular users on Ubuntu. So maybe it can be useful, useful for exploitation, but I didn't, didn't know how to use it. That is the example of the kernel warning. You can see here that there is a uh, code line where warning happened, the contents of the registers, and the call trace. So a lot of information. So I uh, spent some time trying to find a solution, and then asked my uh, friend, Andrei Konovalov, who is a very well-known uh, well uh, kernel security researcher, and he presented me with a really good idea to put the payload in the kernel stack and hold it there with, uh, with the same technique, uh, use a fault FD, like in the heap spray by Vitaly Nikolenko. And... Uh, it was a really nice idea, which helped me a lot. Uh, I think, I believe it is a novel method. Let me call it Cyrus method to credit my friend. Uh, so I had an inside. I can uh, read the kernel warning, parse it, and extract the stack uh, RSP um, uh, register and understand the location of the kernel stack. Then next, I can anticipate the future uh, position of the payload in the kernel stack on the next system call. So I have the place uh, with known address in the kernel space where to put my payload. And that was the most uh, pleasant uh, moment of the research, just like uh, Halver Flake told us today at the keynote. Uh, this, uh, that kind of moment uh, make, uh, make hacking really ha ha um, really Mm. that uh, joyful. And so I created the exploit orchestra, which uh, did the exploitation. 
First, I will show the kernel warning with the useful information. Here you can see the RSP register with the address of the kernel stack. And moreover, you can see R11 register. Uh, it starts from 8F, uh, which means that that is the loca location somewhere in the kernel code. And that uh, pointer can be used to bypass kernel address space layout randomization. We can con calculate the offset, uh, randomized offset of the kernel um, text. Now about the exploit orchestra. <laughs> uh, it, it consists of 50 uh, p threads in five different roles. Uh, there are two racer, uh, racer p threads which compete each other to hit the race condition for later memory corruption. Then I have 44 sprayers, which do set exutter uh, to perform the heap spray, uh, powered by user fault FD. Such number, uh, I, I uh, chosen such number just empirically to make the exploit really stable. So it is the um, minimum, uh, mi minimal number which I, uh, which I chosen um, when for the exploit to be really stable and not fail. Then I have two p threads for catching the page fault created by user fault FD. One uh, p thread for parsing the kernel log to extract the valuable information from the warning and adapting, ad adapting the payload. Finally, I have the one fatality p thread which triggers the privilege escalation. And p thread of different roles synchronize on different sets of p thread barriers. That's how my exploit orchestra looks like. It is me uh, conducting it, p thread, and this guy with drums, uh, I, sh I think he is a fatality p thread which perform, uh, performs the privilege escalation. Now, how the exploit is played? Uh, I will describe it in chrono chronological order. First, we have barrier prepare, when, where all the p-threads prepare uh, before they exploit. 44 sprayers create files in temporary file system for later uh, using uh, in set exutter. And they come to barrier and wait. The kernel message, uh, kernel log parser opens the kernel log, dev k message, and comes to uh, barrier as well. And two race racers come to the barrier, and when they all together come to the same barrier, the barrier opens, and they uh, start to work further. Then we have barrier race. It is only for two p-threads, uh, for racers. Racers first uh, sleep for a while to let other p-threads go to the next barrier and sleep. And then uh, two racers come to the barrier, and uh, after that start to um, to, to work with uh, Vivid Driver, as I described, to hit the race condition. Uh, next barrier is barrier parse. Two racers, after, after uh, hitting the race condition, come to this barrier where the kernel message parser is waiting. When uh, racers come, barrier opens and kernel message parser understands, okay, the racing is finished, now I uh, need to parse. It parses the kernel warning, uh, uh, parses the kernel log, and uh, finds the RSP and R11 registers, th the values of them, and uh, it calculates the addresses for the payload and adapts the payload, because now after parsing we know where the kernel stack is uh, uh, is in the memory. Finally, it adapts the payload and uh, comes to the next barrier, barrier key stack. Here, two racers are waiting for, uh, for, the, uh, for this p-thread, and when they are all together in the p-thread, they start uh, the, uh, they call the adjust timex system call, which puts the payload on the kernel stack. I will tell about this syscall a little bit uh, later. After placing the payload on the kernel stack, uh, in the page fault handler number two, we, ha we catch two page faults from uh, the racers. Uh, 
and come to the barrier where sprayers are waiting. Then sprayers uh, understand that it's time to put the payload on the kernel heap and uh, call set exciter, powered by user fault FD, and these uh, pthreads hang. And in the page fault handler number one, we catch all those page faults, 44 page faults, and understand, okay, now the heap spray is finished. We come to the next pthread, or the next barrier, uh, barrier fatality, where the fatality pthread is waiting. And fatality pthread understands uh, when the barrier uh, opens that it's time to, privilege, uh, to do the privilege escalation. Uh, and that's it. So this method, method allows to bypass uh, supervisor mode access and execution prevention from the kernel thread context restrictions and bypass uh, kernel address space layout randomization as well on Ubuntu server. Uh, now I want to tell you about the exploit payload. So uh, as I already mentioned, the payload is uh, created in two places, in kernel heap by spray pthreads which call set exciter, and in kernel stack by racer pthreads, which call adjust timex. Adjust timex is the system call which, uh, which calls on when kernel handles it. It calls copy from user, from the user space to the kernel stack. There is a structure for uh, the timex structure which is filled by the user space data, and it is large enough to put the payload. Um, the exploit payload consists of three parts, which you already seen on the diagram. The first is VB2 buffer, which is in the kernel heap. The second is VB2 queue, which is in the kernel stack. And finally, the mem ops with the function pointer, which is in the kernel stack as well. And this, uh, this diagram shows my payload, how it is organized. On the left, uh, left hand side, you see the kernel heap and uh, VB2 buffer which is overwritten by our heap spray. This uh, VB2 buffer refers to VB2 queue, which is at the known place in the kernel stack. Uh, the data to the kernel stack is written to, is written to kernel timex structure, but the VB2 buffer refers to the VB2 queue, so, uh, there type, some type confusion uh, happens because of use after free. The VB2 queue refers to mem ops, and I had to overlap all the structure, uh, all the structures, because I have uh, I have limited space in the kernel stack. The mem ops has uh, this v adder point, function pointer, which points to stack pivoting gadget, and uh, the argument for this function, for vadder function, comes from vb2 buffer. And this, this is address of the uh, ROP chain, which is at the kernel stack as well. So, uh, final stack is uh, doing the privilege escalation, uh, and it is some kind of combination of return-oriented programming and jump-oriented programming, so it is drop and drop. Um, that is the, um, uh, the definition of the function where we uh, do the control flow hijack. The argument on x86-64 is passed, is passed through uh, via RDI register. And this RDI register is under our control since we control the argument. So there is an excellent gadget which uh, uh, fits uh, this, uh, this requirements. Push RDI and pop RSP, then return. So uh, our controlled argument goes to stack pointer, and then uh, we can uh, execute our uh, ROP chain. The, this ROP chain is executed in the kernel thread context. So it is a bit unusual. Usually people just uh, overwrite the credentials of the user space process of the exploit, but here we don't have user space. That's why I had to do it another way. Uh, so that is the ROP chain. I will describe it in details. Uh, 
Uh, first, we pop the uh, R15 uh, register, and the value which uh, gets to this register is the address of run command function from kernel reboot.c. And uh, the argument for this run command function will be uh, the uh, name of some shell script. So I needed to pass the address of the string as an argument. So next uh, gadget uh, does pop RDI, and the address of the shell command comes to RDI register, which will be the argument of uh, run CMD command. Then uh, I jump to R15, so run CMD command is executed, and the argument of the command is uh, the uh, shell script. Then after privileges are escalated, I have this uh, do task dead function, which is called uh, the same way. I will describe it why it is needed. But first I want to show the shell command. It simply drops the password for root. So next time after exploit worked, uh, we can log in uh, under root without uh, uh, giving the password. And the last step uh, with this, the last trick with do task dead is for so-called system fixating. Uh, if I let the kernel thread uh, work after the privilege escalation, it provokes some unnecessary kernel crashes, so we need to keep the system work, uh, working. That's why I decided to just kill this kernel thread, and when uh, do task dead is performed in the kernel thread, it dies, and uh, we have no crashes. System uh, uh, continues to work. Now the demo. Yeah, here, here I log in as a normal user on the right-hand side and show some information about the system. First, about the distribution, then about the kernel. It is the original Ubuntu kernel. Now I show that uh, supervisor mode Access prevention and supervised mode execution prevention are enabled. You can see it from PROC CPU. Yes. Now I show the kernel command line to show that I didn't disable uh, kernel page table isolation or uh, kernel address space layout randomization. And now I show that the vulnerable module is loaded. It is done manually. Yeah, now uh, I try to, I show that it is a normal user. I try to log in as root, and it asks for the password. No way. Now let's connect to this virtual machine via SSH and run the exploit. Yeah, very fast. Shell command is run as root. And let's try to log in as root. Yeah, without password. <laughs> I also want to say that the exploit, turned out that exploit is really, really stable. It all, also never fails. Um, so I'm glad. Uh, <laughs> Now, uh, about possible exploit mitigation. Very interesting part. First of all, uh, recent kernels have this unprivileged user fault FD setting. If we set it to zero, uh, the user fault FD is not available to unprivileged user. So um, it can disturb the way how the payload was placed in the kernel heap and the kernel stack. Another mitigation is uh, against the info leak uh, through the kernel log. Uh, 
there is a Damask restrict sys control. If we set it to one, uh, we need, um, as I remember, cap sys admin uh, capability to read the kernel log. But, uh, by the way, Ubuntu users, uh, regular users, are participants of admin group, and they can read varsys log, var log sys log anyway, even if the setting is set to one. Uh, next uh, is the feature uh, from JR Security, an interesting one, called Pax Run Case Stack. It randomizes the, uh, the location of the kernel stack on every uh, system call, on each system call. So that makes the exploit um, guess the future position of the, uh, of the payload on the kernel stack. Next feature, uh, it can break the rope and drop chain, which I used. It is Pax wrap from JAR security as well. Finally, there is, hopefully in future, there will be ARM memory tagging extension support for the Linux kernel, which can kill use after free bug class uh, in general. Now the conclusion. Investigating and fixing this vulnerability, developing the proof of concept exploit, and preparing this talk was a really big deal for me. And I really hope you enjoyed it. Today I will publish a detailed write-up about the exploitation. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. There is a question. So is the warning that you've used, um, is it triggered by the same bug, or is it a different bug? Um, it is triggered by situation uh, when we have buffers in a strange state in the uh, queue of buffers on streaming stop. So it is some uh, generic warning which can happen in different situations as well. But in that case, our driver uh, just triggered this warning because it unexpectedly added the buffer to the queue during the streaming stop. So it's still possible to trigger it with your fixes applied? Yes, yes. Okay. Because this warning just shows the situation when the dr some driver behaves bad. I want to notice also uh, there was an announcement by ZDI uh, in autumn, as I remember, that there, is, there was some vulnerability for video for Linux subsystem. It was use after free as well. It was reported to ZDI, and Android uh, systems were affected. But it was reported without the proof of concept exploit. I don't know, maybe because of kernel thread restrictions. Anyway, uh, the technique which I showed maybe can be applicable to other bugs in this subsystem. Any more questions? Doesn't look like it, so thank you. Ah, wait, there's one more. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for, for the great talk. Um, just one question. You've mentioned the, uh, the custom syscaller mm -hmm. implementation or your, your customizations. Could you tell us more about that? Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, so. Uh, syscaller, uh, I, I would say, fuzzing consists of two parts, uh, the fuzzer itself and the system which you fuzz. So to modify this, um, uh, the, your, your fuzzing, you can change both things. And in my case, I modified the kernel to drop all the unnecessary uh, warnings and uh, information about deadlocks, uh, lockups, and all of that. That allowed uh, the fuzzing process go deeper. Uh, mm, originally, uh, fuzzing would stop on the warning, but I disabled warnings. So my fuzzing hit the, uh, the um, use after free bug, which is exploitable. Uh, that's why uh, when I disabled my kernel changes for deeper fuzzing, I saw this warning and got an idea how to exploit. So then, are there now any more questions? Okay. <laughs>
then uh, thank you very much for the thank talk. You.